Welcome to season four of And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. I've written with hundreds of artists and writers over the years, and my favorite part of each session is the first hour when we catch up about life, the industry, politics, composition, whatever. So this is a journey of learning why people write songs, how people write songs, and most importantly, who the people are who write the songs. I'm producing this with The Great Joe London, Big Deal Music Publishing, and Mega House Music Management. If you want to listen to the songs we discuss in this podcast, follow us on our socials, find out about special events, or buy some of our merchandise, go to our website, www.andthewriteris.com. Oh, and if you enjoy And The Writer Is, please rate and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever your preferred podcast listening site is. Welcome to And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. Today's guest is the legend, songwriter giant, A-list producer, former Curb artist, (laughs) who's earned multi-Grammy nominations and wins, has gone a gajillion times platinum, has been crowned ACM Songwriter of the Year, and is an all-around country and sometimes not country music personality. He's worked with almost every single person you could think of in the country world from Willie Nelson, Keith Urban, Tim McGraw, Blake Shelton, Dolly Parton, Reba McIntyre, and of course, the six-time winning Grammy Award artist Casey Musgraves. He has a ridiculous 38 number ones and is nowhere close to stopping. From Mineral Wells, Texas, this family man is not just an advocate, but as our friend Ashley Gorley said, quote, he's the cream of the crop, the real deal, best in town, ultra talented, and also hilarious. He'll be a fun interview. End quote. And the writer is Shane McNally. Hello. God, that was quite a build up. Thank you so much. So you did Ashley before me? Oh, yeah, no, I not only did Ashley, I did a bunch of people before you. You were, like, way down on the list. I was like, can we make sure, <laughs> just do us you a favor. You did it alphabetical, though, right? Yeah, exactly. Perfect. That's, that's, Perfect. that's how it works. Yeah. Um, how many number ones do you have? That what is thing it? said 38. So yeah, is that right? I mean, who's counting? Right. Me. <laughs> I mean, that's a that's that's insane. And, and you know, I kind of wanted to just, uh, since we did this in Ashley's, um, I'm just gonna read. I, um, I'm gonna just read off some of them. This is only half of them, but I just want you know, just reading titles and the name of the artist takes about as long as it takes to listen to an entire song. That's how many lyrics are in just naming the titles. The title. So I just feel like it's kind of fun. And songs are so short now. You know, you probably could just um, say the title better than playing them. Somewhere with you, Kenny Chesney. Kiss tomorrow goodbye, Luke Bryan. Mama's broken heart. Miranda Lambert, Come Over, Kenny Chesney, Better Dig 2, The Band Perry, Hold, Hold, Young and Crazy, In Between is Frankie all the singles Ballard. that didn't go number one. Yeah, well, we'll through. get to that too. <laughs> Say You Do, Dirks Bentley, Stay a Little Longer, Brothers Osborne, American Kids and Wild Child, Kenny Chesney, Leave the Night On, Take Your Time, Sam Hunt, Hold, hold, there's more, there's more. T-shirt, Thomas Red. different for girls. Uh, Dirks Bentley featuring L. Kane, that's a good one. Vice, Miranda Lambert, John Cougar, John Deere, John 316, Keith Urban. If I told you, Darius Rucker. I mean, there are so many, it's, and, and I know I'm missing a bunch. Body Like a Backroad, Sam Hunt, Drinking Problem, Midland, Unforgettable, Thomas Red. Damn, man. Um, do you ever, uh, why, why are you still doing this? I, I've asked myself that every day. Do you really? No. I, no, I, um, I guess there is some truth to that when you get to a point where it starts to feel, um, I, there is a numbness to it. Uh, I, wanna, I want to feel, this sounds so <laughs> cheesy, but I, I'm trying not to make it sound, you know, all in my head. When I say it, but I have gone through, you know, the last year feeling like, what am I doing it for? Um, because I know the feeling of when you write something that you're just like, you cannot wait to play it for people. You just can't wait for someone to record it or, or 
just to have it yourself, just to listen to the demo. And I haven't had that experience in a while. Um, mostly because it was just, I was writing so much that I, I stopped being able to tell if I was writing for the commercial monetary value of something or because my heart had to say it. And what got me here and what most of that list is comprised of that you just said are songs that felt like they had to be written, that um, I couldn't sleep because of them. And so, uh, you know, I'm really, I've really cut back and I'm really trying to just do things that, that feel good, even if they feel bad, because I just want to feel something, you know. Oh, uh, right. Damn, you write lyrics when you don't even want to. Like that already sounds good, right? Um, how do you get how do you get from Mineral Wells, Texas? You're born there. What do you have yeah. siblings? I have a sister um who is younger than me, and we um my mom was a single mom, and nobody played music around me that wasn't nobody said to me that writing songs was a job. Um, so I thought you had to be a singer if you wanted to be on the Country Music Awards, which is where I really wanted to be. And um, so I started singing. I became obsessed with country music. I had these... Like at five years old? Uh, kind of I thing, would say my like... first memory uh, is... I rem- my first memory of music is, is I was probably four or five and I was in my mom's... Uh, Monte Carlo, because I can remember the car, and I know that Southern Nights by Glenn Campbell was on the radio. And that is the first memory of music for me, where for some reason that I can go right back to that moment when I hear that song. I know the road we were on, and it just something stuck with me. I just, I was made to do it. I was, you know, I was, I started making up songs around that time and singing them to my mom. And, and uh, I think most songwriters probably have similar stories, but. She would say, where did you learn that? And I said, I made it up. And sometimes it would be to the melody of other songs, like probably to Mary Had a Little Lamb, but I would write new lyrics to it. Um, And then around 11 or 12 is when I started to really put songs together. Like I understood the layout of songs. I don't, when I look back on that and think about some of those songs, I just understood how to do it. I, you know, it's like, I, I don't know if I just listened to so many songs and saw the patterns of where, you know, what should happen at the top of a chorus, the way the backside of a chorus should pay off. I just, I understood that in a really bizarre way. Did teachers get that? Did anybody say, hey, you're a songwriter? No. Or are you just no. still figuring it yeah, out? Yeah, I was still point? figuring it out. And and I would, you know, put songs in the tape recorder. And um, I also did this thing that where I had, and I, again, I'm probably speaking the same kind of language as people in this room, but I, I would, I got a second tape recorder so that I could do something on one of them and record and push play on what I had recorded and then put another track yeah. down, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I didn't know then what I was doing and my mom did not know what I was doing. That didn't, she didn't go, oh, you're going to make records because of this. Uh, you know, she really wanted me to sing songs that were popular because when I would go and do these shows and stuff, nobody wanted to hear an original song from a 12 year old. So, you know, I, I was singing uh, popular country music. Um, what is the first song that you wrote? Do you know what it was called? I know the first song I recorded that I wrote. I had written songs before this that, you know, probably weren't as put together, but I, I actually, my, grandparents gave me some money to go into a studio when I was 13 and I recorded a song called Hollywood and it was a play on words. It was about a girl named Holly who would. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And so H- even- Hollywood do something? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and really even funny. though, yeah. as goofy as that sounds, I still think at 13, I'm like that you kid like it. understood something yeah. that, you know, it's just yeah. a little strange. Yeah. Really. Um our friend Brandy Clark in this segment, what would Brandy Clark ask Shane? <laughs> um, she had asked in a similar question. She said, um, "Ask what was the first song that you wrote that that wasn't a big hit?" Um, when he, she says, "What is it?" Ask him what was the first song he wrote that hasn't been a big hit that made him think he was really good at this. But I guess Hollywood would probably be it. <laughs> I don't, I, you know, I definitely thought Hollywood was a big old hit. I mean, you know, every, every, I think all of us think that whatever the last song or the last round of songs we've written is our, is going to be the best we do. And so I certainly was like, why am I not in Nashville? Uh, this would 
completely take off, you know, and I couldn't, I would send tapes off to people. Did you know that already at that point? Wow, I want to go to Nashville. And I mean, how many people live in, in that town? There's got to be about 10,000 live in okay, Mineral so Wells. Um, yes. And, and, but it's not tiny, but it's, you I know, would make, you know, like small. fake records, just artwork and stuff. And yeah. tr- I had, you know, titles of albums and I would always put, Produced by um, Tom Collins because Tom Collins was a uh, Ronnie Millsap's producer, and I would see his name on his records over and over, and I that was the closest thing to a sound that I wanted to be. It's crazy. So. Um, well, you appeared on Star Search at fourteen, yeah. as I'm sure people have referenced many times. <laughs> so I mean, I tried very hard to get away from that reference. Actually, I, I'm just now at forty four years old, thirty years later, coming into being okay with that. It was. A terrible. I was so terrible. Really? And yeah, I just wasn't good. Did you? It's super did, embarrassing. Like, but to go from that, you know, you get you get chosen. You must have sent them a tape or yeah, something. Yeah, sent them a tape, and then I had around. to go. No, I, I no, I had never been anywhere. So we sent a tape, and then I had to go audition in Dallas, and then I'd go second audition in Dallas, and then and uh, and then eventually ended up coming out to LA to tape one episode that I lost on. That's so crazy. Do you have any idea who else was on it? Uh, no, it wasn't like I, you were on, and then there. there no, was I wasn't the next against to... Britney or anything. That would actually be <laughs> such a better story. Yeah. Um. Uh. So, you know, you graduate high school, but then you go. You know, you already then moved to Tennessee, right? Well, I went or to no? the University of Texas in Austin for one oh, semester. Did? Okay. And all I did that was when the songwriting thing really kicked in because okay. being away from home and being away from like I had been playing. Opry's and there's this Opry circuit in, in Texas and in Oklahoma and Arkansas. And I had been doing that through high school. And then to not be in that and go to college, I went because, you know, I needed to get, quote, a real job, a, a real trade. But what happened was that was when the songwriting thing really kicked in because I would just spend, I would miss class right. and sit in my dorm room and write songs. So what happened was I had in that, Semester, I, there was a movie called The Thing Called Love that uh, Sandra Bullock and Christian Slater were in, and it was about the Bluebird Cafe. And I don't even know if it came out then. That's when I saw it. And so we, the second semester of that, my spring break, a, f- a few guys and I that I had met there, we all took my grandmother's minivan to Nashville, and I put my name in a hat at the Bluebird, and I sang two songs that I had written. And that was when it was like, I'm not leaving. What were those songs? Do you know? One of them was called Long Walk Home. And I, I'm laughing because I remember, I can go back to most of my songs from that time and tell you what song I was rewriting. And there was a big song by the Judds called Young Love that's about these kids meeting and then what happened as they got older. And it's exactly the same song, almost even the same melody, but it was called Long Walk Home. Does anybody teach you this at that point? I mean, no. no. You're just figuring it out. You just had an innate feel for the for the industry. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, I'm so glad that for the my blind uh, faith in myself at that time. You know, I certainly uh, lost a lot of my confidence after that, and had I, it wasn't always like that. But going at that point, I was like, I'm really good at this. So, and I got a record deal really fast. I mean, I, once I moved to Nashville, I had a record deal within six months. Um, I had a publishing deal right away. And that was when I was 19. And then, you know, after That's, failed record deal, failed record deal, failed publishing deal, I got my first actual cut at 34. Crazy. Yeah. Wait, so the failed deals, because I think. It- that's something that we all go through. Yeah, we've all had the deal that that we thought was the one, and it's like there's something exceptionally humbling about going through that. I mean, and it's not like just everything humbling, went well. It's like leveling. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. Well, I was on Curb Records, and at the time, Curb had, I mean, they literally dominated the chart. They had uh, Tim McGraw, Jody Messina, Leanne Rhymes, Winona, um, and all of her solo projects, and then. I, I, someone just showed me a chart. Actually, Brandy Clark sent me a picture of a chart recently and said, look at who's number 44. My single was at number 44. And the top five were all Curb acts. And so it really was like a time when it felt like, oh, if you're on Curb, you know, then this is going to happen. It didn't. And it really, I was in the radio game that is no different than the radio game that I play now with artists that I work with. It is... Nashville pays so much attention to the ad week 
And uh, it's so funny to me that after all this time and with even all the new things that have come along, we are still so focused on radio. And that can be a really devastating fight because there isn't, you never know what the reason is Ultimately, there's so many factors, you know, that come into play. And I really blamed my label um, because that was the that was who I felt like was at fault. But now being in the label business and having done this so many times, I realized they really wanted me to win. Of course. You know, I feel very differently about that now. Who was at fault? Uh, you know, it just it wasn't my time. The songs weren't good enough. Um, I was being so inauthentic at the time. I was closeted. You know, I think people, especially in country music, consistently they gravitate towards authentic things. Sure. And I think any sort of uh, wall that put you put between an artist and the audience, they're going to read it. And mm-hmm. I just don't think I connected. When were you not closeted? When did you come out? Um, I moved to L.A. after being in Nashville six years and losing that deal and actually have another, another deal at RCA that fell through. Uh, all of that closeted, you know, had a pretend girlfriend, had a secret boyfriend. Um, did the girlfriend know? She did. It was, you know, she was, had been a girlfriend before. Sure. So she was very kind to sort of pretend and not like just, she actually went on the road with me during that time when I was like open for Chesney and Alabama and did these big tours and she was with me. And uh, so then I came to LA and I was really just coming to sort of get away. And I was staying at a place, my publicist had a place in West Hollywood that she let me stay in for a couple of weeks. And I was walking around in the beautiful sunshine of LA and got, you know, the way, the way people do when they come to LA and you're like, I've never been anywhere like this. The weather, the the energy, and and mostly I saw guys like holding hands on the street. And I was so thrown by this, but also felt so liberated. And I stayed for eight years. And I honestly, in that eight years, I couldn't tell you what I did besides worked at a gay bar. And I played Hotel Cafe every few weeks and did like songwriter shows. But it, so much time went by so fast, but it was all part of the sort of evolution of finding myself and it was important to what happened next. You know, it sure. had to have happened. Did you express any of that through writing during that time? Were you writing at all during those eight years? I mean, obviously- Yeah, I was writing by myself and, and, and I would put out like independent projects and I would sell them at my shows and I would record, you know, my live shows and then sell them at the next one. And um, yeah, it was cathartic in that way. I mean, I, I really was writing what I believed to, to be a record that um, would certainly someone would walk in at some point and like, you know, want to sign me as a singer songwriter. It just never happened. And I was, and I was really consistently selling out shows everywhere on Sunset and had a really good following, but no, it just never, nothing ever happened. Why did you decide then to go back to Nashville, which seems like it wasn't as accepting of you as who you are? It, you know, what happened was I, after eight years, I had this, you know how you have those like people that are investors? Um, you've, you've heard this word all the time. Yeah. Oh, we have this investor. Well, I had this investor who started this publishing company for me and who had more money than they knew what to do with and they didn't know how to, you know, and I just, I just wanted to be writing and I was getting overpaid for something we had no idea what we were doing. So I had enough money to buy a place in LA. And this was in 2007, right before the big market crash. (laughs) And I lost that house. And in the process also lost my car. And I was going through a really bad breakup and it just felt like complete bottom. It was like, this cannot, I am on the wrong road here. And I went to Nashville for the first time in years and wrote with Erin uh, Enderlin, who I didn't know her before. And we wrote a song called Last Call that everybody instantly in Nashville was excited about. And Leanne Womack recorded it pretty quick. And for me, that was just a, the tiniest light to hang on to. And I just went back. 
Yeah, all you need just is from hope. That. Yeah. As a songwriter, it it's like hope is is everything. Even if even if all of our songs fall through just as often as they work. And so it's like just having that hope keeps things it keeps things going, you know. And I, I went back and slept on my sister's couch, and she got me a job at a restaurant there that my sister my sister did, and I was working there, and I was ten years older than everybody else working there, and I would be in the kitchen waiting for my food to come up, and my song would come on the radio, and I wouldn't tell anyone because I didn't think, what am I going to say? Like, oh, I wrote this song, and why are you here? Well, because you don't make any money for a while, and. I had no, nothing to hold me over. Yeah. So that was how it, you know, that was what sort of took me back to Nashville. And I just followed, like I said, any hope, like you said. I mean, that really was the, the word. It was just that sliver of hope. The first, the first singles anybody has is, um, it's really shocking for a writer because most writers really are struggling. They give up everything to be a, a writer or an artist. And when you first hear your songs on the radio, the assumption is that, that, you know, in LA, you know this, this, but it's just because you're rich doesn't mean you're famous, and just because you're famous doesn't, doesn't mean, mean you're rich. rich. So it's such, I love that line, and actually hadn't heard it like that. You know, and and if you go, um, it, you you just the assumption is that oh, I know that song, therefore the people who wrote it are wealthy, and and those people at the fastest they won't see money for eighteen months, and at that time. In, at, at the early, you owe so many people money. And at that you, point. and <laughs> and and that's another thing. Yeah, even when that that happens, you know, there are people who invested in you and your career, and they're they want to get paid back first. So by the time you actually see money after a hit, you know, it's it, if you see money, what it does is it keeps the ball rolling, it gives you a, an opportunity to get the second one. It's really the money starts coming in after you have that. I think a lot of people assume that once they hear that, you know. That song that they can spend, yeah. start yeah. spending, but I, in reality, you're you're still working it. And a, and for everything you know. that I had lost at that point, I was so scared of getting any money because I had been, you know, not smart with it before. And so, what really there was this really sort of accidental uh, blessing that happened um, with that song, particularly. I didn't have a publishing deal, and I had just met my now husband. And he didn't understand the music business, but he was a business person. And he, when people started offering me publishing deals because of that song, he said, I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. That song's on the radio. Why would you give up half of your money when you did it all? And we wrote that out and I've never, I own all my publishing. And it's so- You that, did an admin I, deal? I, yeah, I've had an admin deal the whole time. Yeah. Crazy. Mm -hmm. So that is one thing that again was not, it seems so strategic now. So many people have been like, oh, you were so smart. It was just that I couldn't get arrested. And then yeah. what happened right after that was one of those just very, you know, rare sort of, it's just, you can't ever predict, but I got a windfall of cuts yeah. that happened really fast. And then it was like, oh yeah, no, I'm not, definitely not going to take a publishing deal. Who was helping you get in the room? Well, nobody. Because that's sort of what a lot of publishers, they actually do something to yeah, not I, you. Yeah, you know, I didn't, most, all of my first, I would say my first, probably I couldn't say for sure, but my first 10 number ones were with people that had never had a number one. Crazy. Yeah, and I didn't have any artist rights. Um, the first artist right I had was with Luke Bryan, and I actually knew him um, before and that's the only song we've ever written together and that was Kiss Tomorrow Goodbye, one of the songs that you listed. And so I really just counted on trying to go in there and do something that, you know, wasn't, it's, it's even harder now, what, uh, nine years later than it was then to get outside cuts. I mean, it really is hard if you're not in the room with an artist now. Right now it's, yeah. it's really difficult. Uh, I was asking one of our friends in this segment we'll call, what would Matt Ramsey ask Shane? <laughs> Um, from Old Dominion, Matt Ramsey. I wish you would ask him today because he's I did. just had surgery and he's on a bunch oh, of pain today? medicine. Oh, I asked him last night. <laughs> so this is perfect. This morning, so, I was like, you were making no That's <laughs> really funny. Um, <laughs> that's probably why I texted you. Uh, but anyway, he said, uh, uh, he said, your instincts in the studio and as a writer are very strong and unique. What was a moment where you learned to trust them? And I, I mentioned him at this point mm -hmm. because... He said that you guys really kind of came 
around the same time you guys all met, you know, we were yeah. all saying it kind of coming up at the same time. So Brandy, him, yeah. Josh Osborne, Matt Jenkins, yeah. um, Trevor Rosen. We yeah. were all this little ragtag group that, you know, none of us believed it could ever happen. Everyone had been in town for over 10 years. And uh, anyway, with that said, uh, he, they, Matt actually has a lot to do with it, my, the trusting of the instinct, because I don't, I'm not technical. I can't sit at a board and I play guitar and piano, but not well enough to do anything other than write. And, and most of the time I don't hold an instrument when I'm writing. So we used to do these demo sessions, all of us that I just mentioned, there are six of us, and we would book a whole day and we would all bring some songs we wrote together, but some it'd be like, we had like 14 slots. And what happened was they started literally and metaphorically pushing me to the board because where we were working out of Ben Phillips's place over in Berry Hill, Ben played drums, but he was also the engineer. So no one would actually sit at the board. He would run it from the drum set in the other room. And somebody kind of needed a set up there to talk to the musicians when we would, you know, when they wouldn't get something right. And it just was me, even on songs that I wasn't a writer on. They would say, Shane, tell them what to do. And that is how it started. And then ultimately what led to me making records. And I don't even know that I trusted it then. They trusted me. They pushed me up there. But then I met Casey Musgraves and her and Luke Laird and I started doing demos. And Luke was a lot more technical and could do things on a board and he could play instruments. And I would just sort of instinctually say what I thought and Casey and I would do that together. And that was the first producing job I had was on her first record. Yeah. I mean, in the segment, what would Luke Laird ask you? He said, um, "Are you getting get the hang I of love it?" This. Um, he said, "Would you say?" Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I never you, know if Luke's is going <laughs> to be serious. Or would not. you say you got uh, you get more song ideas while getting a spray tan <laughs> or while listening to the album you put out on Curb in two thousand? I would say spray tanning has been a lot more inspiring for me. Yeah, no doubt, because um, I spend a lot more time doing it than listening to that record. So the first Casey album, now I just introduced Brandy Clark's 12 Stories to uh, Andy Grammer this week and I said, you just need to listen to this album. That's, to me, that's one of my like island albums. I think that's, that's like the most brilliant album I, I, I own. I just, lyrically and musically, it's so authentic and it feels so real. Um, I like hunted Brandy down to make her write with me after after hearing that. And to see that, you know, you guys had this rapport and to see what you guys did when you did wor- work with Casey on this first on the first album and whatnot. You know, how was it that you guys took you know, found an artist like Casey who's got her own, uh, you know, amazing abilities and then nurture that with that crew of Luke and Brandy yeah. and tell me about that especially right now, which by the way, this week you won the Grammy for, you know, for uh, song of the year for country song of the year, and uh, in my book, you should have had uh, a Grammy for all of the things that she she was a part of because I think that this is and for Rainbow, right? Mm-hmm. That was, and then but for album of the year. I don't know. Did you get one also for album of the no. year? You didn't. And this is one of the things that I, I posted on on Twitter that you know they they changed the rules where now you have to quantify your involvement to get a Grammy when your involvement with Casey is beyond uh, what some people accomplish by having a a certain quantity of involvement. When clearly Space Cowboy, Rainbow, and what you've done with her is is uh, unmatched. So, uh, as I said, I, to is, all the people involved, you, you, you have a Grammy in my book. I fought to get songwriters on the album of the year. Yeah. The next thing I'm fighting for is to make sure that they lose the quantifying uh, statute, which was established, in my opinion, partly because of the fear of what happens on rap albums, yeah. which to me is... Not a good look for the Grammys, and it's not just an because of thing. not wanting to acknowledge that many people or something. Yeah, they people would say, well, it affects ticket sales, 
and things like that. And it would be like, well, then everyone's going to come up on stage and not realize that it was a lot of like, well, then you're just going to have an artist and a mastering engineer up there right. and mixers. And you're not going to have the people who actually created the album, not to take down the mixers and, and mastering engineers because they obviously do something imperative Absolutely. in the recording. It's not about, but, yeah. but your involvement in that was is essential. But Well, I, yeah. and I will just speak to that for a second. First of all, I love the way you said that. It is, you know, I've been really lucky with her and with other artists, but we've, you know, I won for co producing enough of the first record that I have on album. We won album of the year for same trailer, different park. And we also won a Grammy that year for a song for Merry Go Round. Um, and so I am certainly, you know, blessed beyond measure in the, the times I've been acknowledged and, and a lot of times because of her. But I do think there's a lot there, you know, a great example of this would be on the record, same trailer, different park. There were only five of us that worked on that record. There was Luke, me, Casey, Josh Osborne, and Brandy Clark. We were the only writers, the only producers. And because of the way the chips fell, Josh, myself, and Casey won Song of the Year. Luke, Josh, I mean, sorry, Luke, myself, and Casey won Album of the Year. Brandy's the only person of the five of us that doesn't have a Grammy. Yeah. And the album wouldn't have been made without her. And the songs, I mean, she had five songs on there. Maybe the saving grace of that Including is that, Follow Your Arrow. Is that people don't realize that Brandy Clark got nominated for Best New Artist where she was in her career. Totally. And uh, if, if there's one thing that we can give Brandy is that if you're listening to this podcast, go listen to Brandy Clark and and then mention her in your social media about how Absolutely. amazing she is. Cause and she's going to win tons of Grammys. Incredible. It's just that particular year you walk away totally. from that going, four people of the five that made this record. Right. You know, and it's just kind of, it is, it's like this strange. Yeah. Well, you know, like you said, like it's the strange line of like, what are the rules and, and they're who still really trying to figure it out. It. The, the whole industry is really young, but I and I keep trying to explain that to to people that our industry, if you know, you're talking about the something like the television industry is about as long as far as contracts are concerned, but something like theater is 150 years older yeah. when it comes to legal precedent and how things, you know, shake down. We're really basically from Elvis on, and we're even, you know, this it's all just a brand new industry. Even though we, we're in the middle of it, we can still change rules. Yeah. Because we just need to step up together as a crew and say, it's fucked up that you don't have a, excuse me, yeah. to, for, for you not to have a, a Grammy for, for album of the year also because uh, you killed that. So, but going to Merry Go Round. And follow your arrow. Those are the kinds of records that people across the industry in pop, you know, you saw it. You saw the the love she was getting from the Katy Perry's and whatnot when that came out right. because everyone wished they wrote that song. Right. Where does where do those songs come from? Well, Merry Go Round started with something my mother said uh, to to Josh Osborne and I. It's kind of a you know. I want to say a, a famous story among our little crew because we've told it so many times at the Bluebird and things. But my mom is a really eccentric character, and we um, were we we all went to Texas to write for Casey's record before the first record came out, and uh, it was Luke, uh, Casey, Brandy, Josh, and myself. And Josh and I got there a couple of days early to and went to my mom's house, um, and. We um, were hanging out and there were all these cars in the yard and driveway next door. And Josh said, what, what's all the cars next door at the neighbors? And my mom said, I don't know, Josh, they're selling Mary Kay or Mary Jane or something. And we just both, you know, that light bulb went off. And so we, when we were alone together, we both just started coming up with every Mary cliche possible. Sure. Like everything the word Mary fell in. And and we told Casey when she landed at the airport, she got in the car with us and we were telling her about it and we were like, it could be so funny. And she was like, I think it sounds sad that people get trapped in that cycle. And it makes me think of my hometown. And when we got out to the place where we were riding, we, you know, we kind of draw names to who's going to be with who. And Josh and Casey and I were 
thrown together and uh, Luke and Brandy were upstairs writing and we, it took us about an hour and a half to write that song. It was so fast uh, once it, we, you know, figured it out and they came downstairs and we played it for them and Luke Laird said, play it again. That was sort of the first sign that we had something really special, you know? Um, what song do you think they were writing upstairs? Uh, do you I know? Actually, dude, it's funny. Brandy references it sometimes and I can't, she laughs about what it was. I'm, I'm, it was brilliant, I'm sure, but I think it was like a funny song, um, but I don't remember. When um, Follow Your Arrow, what I thought was really cool about it is that two-thirds of the writers are are open and out of the closet and it's a giant banner. And even if you include Casey being open about smoking weed. And, well, Casey's you know, a gay man. <laughs> yeah, so. Perfect. But that whole idea, like, there was, there was, there was zero fear with that song. Did you, all of you feel that? Or is it, or, or was it, we're just writing a song and we're writing it internally. But when that came out, it felt like um, it, it was a, an anthem for a I lot of people. I did not get that. Like, I loved it. But we already had a record that was done. And being the producer on the record and trying to get her to agree to it being finished, we wrote that song. And another song that ended up on the record called Silver Linings, we wrote that, though both of those songs, after the record was done, like completely done. So I thought we were writing for the next record. And Mary Go Round was already on the charts and they were gearing up. And she was like, these songs have to be on my record. And Follow Your Arrow, I didn't even realize people would be funny about it until she took it to the label and they said we're not that's definitely not going on your record and then she fought so hard and said uh no i, I it's absolutely going on my record they said okay well it can't be one of the first five tracks on the record because it was still that considering that like then people might get confused that it was it's number 11 on the record um but i remember that being a, a conversation it can't be towards the front of the record and uh, and it'll how, never be a single. How do you feel about that? Well, that's when I first. That was the first time I started to realize we had something. <laughs> right, exactly. Because I liked it, but I didn't know it was going to push people's buttons, and that started making me want to fight for it. The pushing people's buttons. You know, when you say as an artist that you know the radio game and you you know it as an artist and where you were, and there's probably not a more referenced artist than Casey when it comes to how misogynistic country radio has been. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you feel from your perspective, having written on so many number one songs, but clearly that's, you know, I don't, I don't know if you have a more influential artist that you've worked with than her, you know, and that's, that's a list of, I mean, you're right. No, let's, I mean, let's well, take Willie it, Nelson and some of the other, but it also and, you know, made, there's a lot of them. It but, made you know, my career, you know, working with her, and what was such the strange thing was that she was the only artist that I was working with consistently that wasn't at the top of the charts. But yet my work with her was what was fueling all the other stuff of making Because everyone wanted to work with exactly. the person who was doing that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So when will radio change and I don't start know. to play I mean, stuff that's out of the box? Well, I mean, she with Follow Your Arrow, you know, that was the lowest, the lowest charting song to ever be nominated for CMA Song of the Year it didn't go top 40 and then and then we won i mean that started to tell like oh there's like two things going on here like people and stapleton later the the, the chris stapleton effect you started to see that uh, there was the radio thing and there's this other thing and i i don't know i think radio i think a lot of the people in radio really want to play music like that but for some reason there's the still this looming sort of uh, shadow of if we play that we might lose listeners because they're polarizing because they have to stay in the middle and uh, you know you just hope that every once in a while it's like I, like there's the circle that's like that is the the radio circle and then there's the the circle that's the artist and who they are all the way and you just hope sometimes those cross for people like Casey so that it brings more listeners to her records. I mean, I don't think having hit records is the end all, but had she not had Mary go round in the beginning, right. I don't know that that many people would have ever heard the rest of that record. And yeah. and she knows the value in that too. And although she's not making music for radio, it certainly helps overall. So I'm hoping that 
you know, Rainbow being the new single and and what is what just happened with her at the Grammys where everyone is saying, look at this girl. You know, this is, it, maybe maybe she'll get a few more ears on it. We were saying she posted, you know, uh, that Rainbow's the new single and it's, it's heading to radio or something yeah, like that. Yeah. She, she posted something like that. Yeah, she said, leave like, your radios on, yeah. Yeah, leave your radios on. I love that. I mean, yeah. I mean that's a... It, that means so much more than just totally. the, the six words it takes to, or whatever, however many, Absolutely. you know, to yeah. say that. So it's different. What are your expectations have for that song? Having, you know, if I told you right now you have a Luke Bryan, the Luke Bryan single, or, yeah. or whatever, you'd, be, you'd have a, your assumption, was, Thomas Rhett, whatever. It's like if it doesn't go number one or top five, you'd be like, this is a giant failure. Yes. For Rainbow, do you? It's, it's I have got, no expectations. Yeah. I mean, I, first of all, that wouldn't have. That was a song. I know you're not talking about that song specifically because you're talking sort of about just having a single on her. But we wrote that song when we were making the first record, and uh, you know, it just never did fit there or the second record, and um, it just kind of fit on this record. Thank God. I mean, I love the way this is all lined up. But I also like Follow Your Arrow. I didn't know when we wrote it the sort of anthem or what people would, I've gotten more messages about Rainbow and what it's meant to people. And I love that, but it's not, we weren't in the moment, we weren't writing it for that reason. Do you think of yourself as, you know, in in a way like a, a gay icon or do you think of yourself? <laughs> I like to think of myself that way, yes. I mean, you um, kind of, but like, you know, there aren't a lot of people and obviously, you know, we'll get into it, but you're you're putting yourself further and further into the limelight. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you have and the gay thing is just look. It's a, it's a responsibility. Ring, yeah, it's not. Interesting. I definitely feel like because I have a family and I'm in Nashville doing country music and I'm married to a man. W- these are all things I didn't think I would ever be able to do, and that is the truth. And and one of the reasons that was so hard for me to come out was because my only dream in life was to be in country music in some form. And I thought this would keep me from it. So I was never going to tell anybody. So the fact that I'm getting to not only live an out life, I'm living my absolute best out life. I mean, it, it's, I have it all. And so I do feel a responsibility to let people know that because it is possible. And it's not just being gay. It's anything that makes you different than the people doing yeah, it, it already. Helps. It, it helps, helps if you if you do you know you you do something outside of the box and exactly. everybody applauds you for and you know for being all the time on, being honest. Gay songwriters, you know? especially in Nashville, will say to me, like, "I'm a gay songwriter. How how do I do this?" And I just say, "You just it has nothing to do with being gay. Th- getting there, it has to do with being better. I mean, honestly, like working your ass off, showing up, and doing it." all the time. And then people go, oh, and on top of that, he was gay. Who knew? And so I don't feel like it was because, I don't, you know what I mean? I don't feel like I, I have, I don't even know how the to goal, say it. The goal, the goal wasn't, wasn't right. that. It's but now a, it's I, a feel, product, but it's I a, feel a responsibility yeah. to, to let people know that it's all possible. If that makes sense, that but sounds you, so self righteous. I'm I'm not trying to sound like here I am on the great, you know, gay platform. I just want no, people but it to know it's it not about being gay. To do, even yeah. it take that out of it, it's you're an inspiration for somebody who comes up from the, generally speaking, the middle of nowhere, Texas, to have 38 number one songs, and and get to work with artists that some that are that are country radio and some that. Our country music, yeah, and to not have anything hold you back other than nothing, right? That's the part that's inspiring. So I mean, yeah. you know, it just happens that people, it, the single being out being Rainbow. Yeah, that's why the timing like, you know. wise is so funny because a few years ago, uh, the New York Times did an article about me, and the one thing I kept saying all along was, I do not want it to be about me being gay. I don't mind if it mentions my husband or my kids, I just don't want it to about me being gay because that isn't, and I was really sort of trying to get away from that narrative. And then of course the headline was out and riding high in Nashville, which cracked me up. But, but, the, but recently I feel the opposite. I feel like 
again, I use the word responsibility. I I don't want anyone to miss that. You know, I don't want anyone that gets to know me or know my music not know that I'm gay because it could be something that shows them in whatever they're trying to do. That uh, that if you if you dream it and you work hard enough and you you know and it's where you're supposed to be, it it will work out. It doesn't have anything to do with your lifestyle or or the things that seem, make you seem different than everyone doing it. In this next segment, we're gonna go <laughs> Ross, and you ask. Are so funny. We're gonna ask. I wish y'all could see it. What? <laughs> what did Ashley Gorley? What would Ashley Gorley ask okay. Shane McNally? Mm-hmm. I think this is important because when you're talking about the two of you guys are like collectively have almost a hundred number one songs with Luke. I think you guys, the three of you guys, probably have a hundred number one songs, which which yeah. is really, it's really not cool and unfair, <laughs> and it's, it's like I'm. I'm I'm pretty offended by. I it, have had those conversations with Ashley. Just like, do you know how bizarre? I mean, he has just been so far ahead of the pack for so long, and is in terms of like the number of hits. It's just like for so long. That's something that happens a couple of years for someone, but he's just been doing it year after year after year, and you know, and it never stops. I mean, you, I'm sure you've sat in the room with him. It's just like this fountain of. It's just words and melody. Yeah, if there's a videotape of any songwriter in music that'd be worth watching in a room, it'd probably be Ashley. I agree. Just because you see the you you better catch it because if That's you right. don't, it's it, he's on to the next. He's thing, on to which the next was thing. Also great, yeah. but if you you could probably write t- ten big songs from one session with him if you could actually if you could capture ca- make sure and organize it. Yeah, I try to just stay on the rails with him. Well, he had a number of questions for you. So oh, number one. What is your favorite chord? I already know this. Three minor yes. every time in every song. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I don't know why that. I, you know, when I talked about tech, technicality, I do know the the number chart. I learned that. You know, when I was an artist and trying to always, I, I associate chords with a feeling. I know a three minor where it hits me in my heart, and there's a bit of musicality to it that it sounds a little cheesy to a lot of people. A lot of people don't like a three minor. It's not a tough chord. Um, but for some reason, it can be snuck in in the strangest places and in the strangest order. And I always go, I love that. And it makes everyone in the room laugh because they're like, well, that's a three minor. It's also the chord that, you know, it's like uh, like Dr. Luke built an entire career on that mm-hmm. chord. Yeah. Like, I know this is the dorkiest conversation ever, to but that on, don't some, know what, yeah. on some level, that that it does have this emotion in the middle of of really singable chords that it's, yeah. you know, without going to the six. It's like that choice you have. It is, yeah. You know? and, they, and you can sing the melodies over both, but. Okay, number two. Which of your famous lyrics do you feel best represents you? Follow your arrow wherever it points. Mind your own biscuits and life will be gravy. <laughs> a little messed up, but we're all all right. Or got hips like honey, so thick and so sweet. <laughs> a little messed up, but we're all all right. Yeah, that line, I am, that, that, that line does sort of always hit me. It's in a tempo song. It's American Kids. I don't think a lot of people sit around crying to American Kids, but it's the line in the song that, I always have to have something, even in an up tempo, that makes me hurt. And for some reason, that line does it. Number three, if you were able to write and record a duet with one artist, would it be Dolly Parton, Ronnie Millsap, George Strait, or Barbara Mandrell? Well, it would have to be Barbara Mandrell, but she doesn't make music anymore and hasn't for a long time. But the yeah, I mean, and probably because that's absolutely not going to happen. That that um, remains the elusive dream. We we <laughs> we can always just hang out at her house. Exactly, and, and exactly. And I get to see her sometimes. And really? She's, yeah. I mean, it's people know I'm obsessed with her, and so through that, I have friends that have worked with her, and I'll get like a video message for my birthday. Or um, it's have you still, guys ever hung out at all? Yeah, like had dinner or something. Yeah, yeah, we have. Um, Is that weird to grow up? And you know, I mean, that's like a it's real weird idol. because I really want to spend all the time talking about things that I remember better than her. Not because she's older, but because it didn't. I would study it and watch these shows with her in them over and over and over. And I mean, like, I mean, I can mention something and she'll be like, "I don't really don't remember that," you know, or like talk about 
deep cuts on a record. Her music was secondary to her. She was a personality. Yeah. And so talking about deep cuts on a record that she was just making it f- to fulfill a requirement. Sure. You no, know, I'm like it's like the the um, the Bob Dylan or something for me. I mean, it's funny how you're you, you just like in relationships. A lot of times you get stunted in a way that you can only stay in that place. I listen to those songs now, and I know those songs are not like they were like early '80s country songs that were trying to be pop songs, and they are not by the standards of great songs. But I still stay in the age I was when I heard them, and I think they're amazing. Um, I want to come back to that last comment, but uh, number four was who is your favorite writer and company to share an office building with? <laughs> Tape room music. Oh wow, that's <laughs> funny because he has that listed as that better be the obvious yeah, answer. I mean, he Ashley is amazing. He he really is. Both of you guys have started publishing companies that are unbelievably successful. How do you feel being a publisher in an, when you were somebody who never signed a publishing deal? That's a really, really great question. And I have, at every turn when we have signed someone new, I have said that. I have said, I have been the advocate for not taking a publishing deal when you don't need it. And I don't ever want anyone to sign with Smack that we can't help. And that always is the last sort of conversation of like, what do you imagine that we're going to do? Because if you want a home and camaraderie uh, and people that will cheerlead and support you and do their best to pitch your songs, but we all know these days it's about relationships the writers have with artists. Uh, Getting a publisher to get you a cut is, uh, it's just hard. And that's just not, you know, it's a rare thing for a publisher to actually do that. Um, I'm not saying they don't, but, That just can't be the reason someone is signing. And the other thing that is a big deal, and I think Ashley is probably the same, um, is that you can't sign at Smack because you think that we're going to get to work together. It has to be the team that is going to be working with you that you're excited about, not me. Because the pressure of that and the time it takes to develop a writer, I just don't have it. And so... um, I just have to always be very honest about that. Doesn't mean we won't write together. Doesn't mean something won't happen where we end up doing a whole record together. But it can't be the reason, right? It, it's a lot of pressure. And I was one. The thing I wanted to go back to is after you're talking about Barbara Mandrell. Yes, that, I'm sure everyone is know, riveted. <laughs> the, but the idea that um, people are as successful as the day you meet them. You know that That's right. that all these people that I listed, you know, you and Brandy and you know Josh and all the other people that you mentioned, Matt, mm-hmm. you guys all came up together. So you look at each other as I can't believe we all from where we started did this together as a as a generation, and the re- the responsibility that we have in our age group is to help facilitate that for younger generations is to be like build your community and build that community with them mm-hmm. and help them out but it's not necessarily you know I used to want to work with I wanted to work with Max Martin so bad yeah and then you know my main co-writer now happens to be signed to him but our involvement it tends to be that he comes in and sometimes says like I like this I don't but it's more that he just helps us write the you know keeps the level of quality at a certain level and he pushes us to be us we're that next generation and then our job is to open up the generation the way you are with Smack and the way I am with my writers and trying to find you know a, a build their community well, so that's... they can look at their friends and be like we did all of these songs together. It's not, really hard you know. to, to not to not under promise because I, what I want to do is tell people when they come in, it's exact, exactly, I love that. I, you know, I used to pass Luke Laird in the hall at Universal because it was the first place that I would get to write when I went back to Nashville. And he was on a big run with Carrie Underwood. I never spoke to him, but I just was like, I know if I wrote with that guy, we would have a hit. And I couldn't. I couldn't get in the room with him. And, and I had... A lot of hits before we got together. It was it wouldn't have been right, you know. That's the thing is I try to explain to everyone is that that finding of your tribe is the number one most important thing. The people that 
are like-minded and are doing it ahead of the curve and are not getting hits because of who they are. That you are building your foundation on music that is better, you know? And that's how it has to happen. I mean, for I, I just don't... I know people have other accidents happen, but to me, finding that community... And then you get to ride that wave out together. I see that at Smack right now with a group of our riders, with with Matt McGinn, who's just had a couple of number ones, and uh, he they have this section of the building. They have uh, him and Aaron Sice, who has a number one this week. His oh, first, he does. yeah. Oh man, that's awesome. I know. And then he's super and, nice. and Ryan Beaver is up there with them, and he's getting a bunch of cuts and it, watching them all together. And like even when we, we're all in the common area, like eating or something, I'm like I. I really, I'm so grateful for my career. And had I had to wait this much longer for it, I wouldn't have survived. But I look at them and I'm jealous because I know I can never feel that way again. Yeah. Of that like, God, we just got to hold. We just got to cut. This song went to number one. I mean, that feeling is, you know, with your friends that haven't had it. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, you can't get that back. Um, I know I started in the beginning asking like, what what do you do next after the the... 38 number ones and while you're still writing and doing everything else but you kind of have a few projects that I, I just want you to touch on because yeah. besides the publishing company and everything else you're doing you have um, you have Sirius that you've been working with yeah I've done a show uh, for Sirius it, it, you know it, it really you have in doing what you're doing it was sort of designed for me to have conversations with my artist friends that I had made music with, and we would tell the stories of how we wrote songs. Casey Marin, uh, who else did it? Tr did it. Thomas Rhett. Um, and I, I enjoy it, but I what I what I love is that there's sort of a what I love about podcasts or you know whatever you call it. That well, we weren't doing a podcast, but it was on Sirius. Uh, I enjoyed doing it, but I yet I haven't yet found the the thing that is the catch for me because right now I'm just having conversations that I would be having with these people anyway, which is kind of cool for people to hear what we talk about, you know, before and after we're writing. But um, if that makes sense, right now I can't quite put my finger on what the purpose is. Doesn't mean I don't want to do it. I just want to find a. Reason. Are you still doing it? Yeah, I'm still like I still like I'm halfway through a. Yeah, a season of ten. Right. I've done five. Right, um, and then I have a record label, um, Monument Records. It's with Sony, and we have um, uh, Walker Hayes, who just Crazy. coming off a big hit. And then we have um, two artists that are going for ads. Because he's still talking in radio terms in the next three months. But it's still a thing. Yeah. It's a thing in pop too. I mean, yeah. I, you can still aim for a Spotify smash. And that can make a record label a lot of money, right. and it can make an artist a lot of money. But there's still such a massive discrepancy in finance, in the and especially when you come from the songwriter side, you only know what having a radio single right can do. So then everything else seems less than. But there's also sometimes it'll show a stream, but doesn't mean that it was. It's not streamed all at the same time by a whole community, and what you still get. Statistically speaking, you know there are twenty times more people listening to Kiss FM in LA right. than our subscribers of Spotify in Los Angeles. So that one spin, so that one spin, some, still some is a whole group of people listening to it. Really hard to to pretend like it doesn't exist when their stats right now are that radio is growing in its listenership somehow. Yeah, you know, and maybe that's because there are fewer radio stations, hmm. but there's still some desire to collectively listen to something. So I, I think it's important to still I listen to talk. the radio. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, yeah. You were just saying you, when you walked in that you were listening to a song. I think you I, know, I'm real. I'm still so. always. I'm still completely intrigued. When I was a when I was a kid, I would take the chart every Sunday that the would be on Sundays, the country countdown. I would write it down. And keep up with it all year. It was so weird, but I was so fascinated by what songs would move up, and and I'm still fascinated with commercial radio because there's so many songs that I hear from artists and people send me things. I hear things on you know Apple and Spotify, and I uh, I'm still so intrigued by what is it that's getting this on the radio? Why this? And that is, 
I don't, I don't, I don't know if I, if it's good or bad. I just know that when I listen and I go, oh yeah, I can, you know, some song like I know I heard the Dua Lipa song a long time before it was on the radio, and I was the New Rules, and I thought, God, I mean, this sounds like it freaking smashed me. I couldn't listen to it enough, and then it did make the jump and became an actual radio hit. But a lot of songs I feel that way don't. There's a great quote about pop radio that's different than country radio, which country radio is a genre and people say in pop that it's not a genre, it's a result. Mm. You know, in theory, tequila is top 20 right now at pop radio. Right. That isn't a genre choice. You can have Bad Bunny rapping in Spanish, you know, the Uh same time that you can have Halsey singing about heartbreak. Right. So, right. you know, in theory it's it's a uh it's it's supposed to be a melting pot of the biggest hits across multiple genres. It doesn't always work that way and there are people who are pop focused. You know, right. but but it's kind of an interesting way to look at it. And, and there aren't subsidiaries of country radio certainly in LA. I mean, I know that there are, but Brandy Carlisle isn't being played on country radio, not even though that's Americana. That right. sh- that should be allowed, Absolutely. you know. So, so it's it's. There's not really a place for that music. It's so funny that that's what's happened. Brandy Clark is a great example too. It's, you know, it's that I think Brandy Clark is just the greatest artist. She makes the best records. She has the best voice. She has the best live show. It's like there's a star. I mean, and in another. In another time, it feels like comparative to a Loretta Lynn or someone like that, she would have fit right in. But here, it's like, where does that... I mean, I guess Americana, I don't know where a lot of that music ends up, you know, but it's it's so frustrating because Brandy Car- Carlisle, I mean, <laughs> her performance on the Grammys was yeah. unmatched. I mean, it's yeah. like she... I thought she won the night, and but yet people wouldn't know... Where to hear that music? Yeah. And you would think people watching it think that she's country. We should start a Brandy FM no and joke. just play Brandy Clark and Brandy Carlisle all day, every day. Um, let's talk about so- Songland real yeah. quick because I think by the time you know people are going to go back and listen to this, and uh, this is a time that's kind of exciting for you. So, yeah. So give a quick rundown of what Songland is. Okay, I'll try not to be too long winded. Uh, so. About four years ago, I got a phone call from a woman named Audrey Morrissey who worked on The Voice, and she was talking about a show that was about songwriters um, based on how songwriters pitch songs and the process that goes into uh, collaborating. And so I loved it instantly. At that point, it cha- it, had, it has changed many in, in its forms many times. But at that time, just the idea that it would be focused on songwriters, I think there's an intrigue. I think this shows, you know, people are interested in and in just now learning that it's not always the artist either alone or even them at all that's writing the songs. And I think people are interested in knowing uh, what goes on in that world. So there's a, a show uh, that NBC is doing and that... Um, I'm on with Ryan Tedder, who's you know uh, arguably the world's biggest producer and songwriter, at, um, and then Esther Dean, who wrote Firework um, and Super Bass and uh, a, you know a ton of things. Only girl in the world. Yes, I mean, and she's it's, it's her personality is just insane. I love her so much. So brilliant. The three of us are the I guess quote judges. The word judge seems really weird for this because we are more collaborators, but but unknown songwriters bring their songs and they pitch them to an artist of the week, basically. And so the the episode that we've worked on was Charlie Puth, who's a a, a big, you know, pop artist, and p- people come in and play their songs for Charlie. And then the three of us, Ryan, Esther, and myself, we say, you know, the, the way this would make more sense for Charlie is if you made it a ballad, or what if you extended your chorus and had a post? Uh, what if you changed that chord to a Three minor. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But that is sort of in a nutshell. And then at the end of the show, he chooses one of the songs and he records it. And so you get to see from the beginning demo stages to where it would end up if someone pitched a song to a, a hit artist, where, you know, where it would, uh, the changes that might happen along the way. And then, of course, he puts his own spin on it. And then you can stream and buy it. Um, so the way I was describing it is like the voice is an unknown singer singing a known song. This is um, 
a known singer singing an unknown song. Very cool. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm excited for songwriters to have because you know not all songwriters are voice type singers, and there are songwriters out there who their voices aren't. I mean, I'd, I'm not the kind of singer that could compete on the voice uh, or, or get attention that way. So I'm hoping that it just shows people, you know, that you th- I think a lot of people ask, I'm sure you get this question a lot, like, well, what, how do you write songs if you don't play an instrument or you don't sing? And uh, I know plenty of really great songwriters who they may sing a little, they may play a little, but they, you know, just enough to go, oh, I don't, you know, Liz Rose is is not really... A singer, or she doesn't really she, but she's written some of the biggest hits of all time, yeah. and so um, she has a deep instinct, and she is as good a storyteller as anyone out there. And not to say she can't sing, but you know, it wouldn't be the kind of voice that would compete on a singing contest. I, I would say, I would say it's a surprising number of our guests at this point. We've done you know fifty of these or more. And wow, I, I really say, was down the list. Oh no, no, really, a bunch of people canceled this week. That's so. <laughs> it was honestly, I was like, I don't, I don't know who that is. Luckily, and they were like, I'm No, right you worked with him that one street. time. He's like, <laughs> so I walked um, over. So anyway, what else do we got? Uh, guess time's running out. Um, all right, so um, no, we'll go to this next segment, which is uh, we'll call five for five. It's, uh, I'm going to okay. just list five names, and you tell me, you know, what comes off the. Top of your head, okay. Something. Casey Musgraves, uh, so um, herself. I mean, that is the main thing. She is an artist that, from the moment I met her, she knew what she would and wouldn't say. To for me, a uh, very frustrating degrees at times. It is. Uh, it has. She has set the standard for me in working with artists because uh, we don't always agree, but. What I know for sure is that she has the final word because she's the one who's going to be saying it. And I really learned that by writing with her. Luke Laird. Always keeps it going. Always makes it fun. He is just the greatest collaborator. I mean, he can write songs by himself. They're incredible. Obviously, I've never been there when he wrote by himself because that would make no sense. But he makes me feel... I'm so, I feel so safe that something great is going to happen or at least something that we enjoy doing because I've never written a song with him that at the end I wasn't like, that was the best day, even when we write the saddest song. Barbara Mandrell. <laughs> I mean, the reason that I got into music, really, because that sort of shiny version of what she did and the glossy thing on TV, I just was so drawn to her. I'm, I'm positive there's some correlation to the fact that I was this little gay kid and she was dressed up in all these you know crazy clothes and so much of hers was about show business. I miss that aspect of the music business. That that sort of mentality that you go out there and give them something. I'm not saying people don't do that anymore. In fact, I went to see Gaga last weekend in Vegas and and saw Bruno last year. And those are two people that are from the old school you know, show business way of doing things. It'd but be it, nice if they had their own show. If it was the if it was the Bruno Mars variety yeah, show, exactly. It's basically what exactly. we exactly. You know. Well, and that's sort of what the James Lady, Gordon's Lady Gaga kind of show. Like, you know, there's yeah. like some of these guys that are James circling Gordon's a around great it, example. You know? It's like this, it feels yeah. like old show business, and I think I was just really into that. Is that you why know? you want to do all these things? You know, I'm you know, again for lack of a better word, a, a judge. Yeah, for you know, show I really the a, reason I want to do these things is because, and I've had a lot of sort of. I've questioned myself about it. Do I want to be famous? Is it the idea of being a celebrity? It, 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 for me, I missed an element of performing. I don't have the kind of voice that I would feel comfortable getting up on stage and like putting out a record. I mean, maybe someday, but it would have to be a stylized certain thing. But I wanted to perform. Every time I do a Bluebird show or every time I, do, I get to go do a CMA songwriter series, I am so lit up by that by the sort of interacting, talking about songs, playing songs, but also, you know, the music element of it, because that's what I know is so great for this show Songland, but it really, the, the being a, in front of the camera or in front of an audience, uh, I had really missed that aspect of being an artist. Your mom. Most inspiring as far as songs go. And, uh, you know, this stubborn, somebody that I certainly got my drive from, she's fearless. If I've, We've often joked that if she had been in the music business and had been my manager, that that uh, there's no telling what could have happened for me because 
there isn't a door she won't knock on. And I have a little bit of that. I still try to play it politically correct and I don't want to bother anybody, but I also have a, a fearlessness to me uh, that has helped me a lot. Michael, your husband. The, a joy. He's the most joyful person. And that is a contrast to, you know, most of the time the creative side of me that thinks you have to be sad or it has to be dark to be good. And uh, he's really taught me about the the lighter side of things and to enjoy the moment. For bonus, your kids. Biggest assholes um, I <laughs> have yet to meet in the business. No, I'm, I'm teasing. I always joke that my kids are assholes. But they are, you know, that's the thing about having kids and people that do and don't. And I, I respect that so many people these days are not so influenced by society that they have to have kids. I mean, that I think that's a newer thing where people are like, you know, it's not for me. And I really, really respect that. On the other side of that, I, for everyone that I love, I always think, I really, really hope you get to do this because something happens to your heart that is indescribable. And those kids opened up a part of my heart that I didn't know existed. And uh, they drive me completely crazy. But I am just so grateful for them. And they inspire me and make me laugh and make me cry. And uh, they're the best thing that ever happened to me. Well, thank you for doing this. It, it, you were telling part of your story. There are a few things that I, I can relate to, and that's you get a record deal, you do the the circuit, you don't sell anything, you get dropped from that record deal, you get another record deal, you don't sell anything, you get dropped from a record deal, you buy a place in L.A., you foreclose on that place, and you have nowhere to go but music. And those, we are 100% on the same path with that. And to have been to your house, uh, I guess it was last year when the Grammys put 12, oh, yeah. 12 people together, six pop people, six country people. We're all kind of somewhere on the bridge there anyway. Yeah. And to be in your house and have you be able to host that, to have your kids around, your family around, to have the artists that were there who were just incredible, you know, TR and Little Big Town. And you were able to turn it around from what I know feels just hopeless to being a leader and to being a mentor and to inspiring a lot of people, whether you know it or not. We are so lucky to have people who are open about the struggle. And if that's to me, that's the whole point of this podcast, for people to feel comfortable in a safe place to, to tell that story and to not sugarcoat it and have to go like, ah, this is the, the biggest thing I have. The number one songs, they come and go so fast. But the community you're building at your publishing company and that you built with your friends when you were coming up from the struggle, that thing you can't doesn't just go up and down the chart. So thank you for doing this. I'm very excited for Songland and all the other things you have going on. Yeah, we'll have to do this in 20 years when, you, when you've when you taken over NBC as a whole. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for all yeah. of that that you said. And I, I really I take that in and it really, hearing it the way you just said it, it really matters. I remember that night specifically at the house having, I have a lot of, you know, fears about having artists over to my house because I still really want to be a cool kid and I, I, I can still put myself in a place of like, I don't belong here, or I don't deserve this. That night felt so cohesive, the worlds of artists, country, pop. It was, I remember when that night was over, I was so proud. So I really appreciate you saying it that way because I wouldn't have thought of it. And I really am honored that you asked me to do this. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of And The Writer Is. If you want to hear music from this songwriter I just interviewed, be sure to check out our Spotify playlist or visit our website at andthewriteris.com. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to us. You can also like us on Facebook and Twitter. And The Writer Is is produced by Joe London, edited by Miles Bergsma, and published by Big Deal Music. 
A special thanks to David Silberstein from Mega House Music and Michael White. Until next time, this is Ross Golan.